Amen. Well, First Timothy chapter number two. Amen. Amen. I just want to give you this thought on the practice of prayer tonight out of First Timothy chapter number two. And Paul talked to much uh, to Timothy about doctrine and and things of that nature by by way of introduction. And uh, he left him there in Ephesus, or beckoned him to Ephesus, and and had him uh, begin to set up leadership there in Ephesus. And he deals with Timothy, and Timothy's a young man. Uh, Paul considers him his own son in the faith. Yes. And, um, you know, we all, uh, the, having a son in the faith is not just for the preacher, amen. Right. And somebody that you've taken under your wing, and you're, you're doing your best to disciple them and walk them along, that's not just for the preacher, amen. That ought to be a part of all our lives. And we'll talk some more about that in days to come, but, but uh, we ought to be looking for somebody. And I, I sure am thankful that the Lord's still in the saving business. And I like hearing those testimonies like tonight where the Bible and the, uh, the Word of God and the, and the ways of God and the church of God make yes, a difference sir. in people's lives and, and we see marriages salvaged. And, and, you know, this world's trying to do it on their own. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And many of us have tried to do it on our own. And we know how much better it is when God's involved in the situation and we turn it over to him. And you see the fruit of that when children get saved like that. And it's a blessing, amen? It's a blessing. And we've really gotten so far away from those type of things uh, that, you know, it seems like it don't even excite people anymore right. like it should. Yeah. And boy, it ought to excite us when we hear those kind of things. And, uh, you know, we just need to get back to teaching folks that that's the normal way for a household is to live around the Word of God and for the church to be the center of their life. And that's what makes the difference. Amen. And, uh, but I want you to look tonight at some ways. That prayer is one way that we see here in 1 Timothy chapter number 2. And these first few verses we see that prayer is a big part of what the church is. And it's a big part of the way that we live life. And so I want you to look at it, and we'll just uh, look at a few things about the practice of prayer here tonight, uh, and then we'll be done tonight. Amen. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter number 2 and verse number 1. The Bible said, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. He said, for kings and for all uh, that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Verse number three, he said, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, uh, in, in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved. Well, I wonder what the Calvinists, that must be their life verse there. Well, yeah. Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, or between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity, I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for a privilege, God, to gather together here around the Word of God again tonight. God, we're thankful, uh, Lord, for, uh, you know, in the day we live in, Lord, oftentimes we hear so much negativity and uh, so, much, uh, so much division and, and so many folks with hateful, uh, just it seemed like everything about them is just hateful. But Lord, I sure am thankful we can come apart to a place of refuge on a Wednesday night. And God, we can share with one another prayer requests. God, we can uh, hear the testimony of, of a young man coming to know you as his Savior, and a home that's been restored. God, we're thankful for that. God, we bless your name for those things. And Lord, I pray tonight, God, that you'd stir in our heart a desire to begin in a prayer place and, God, to allow you to make a difference in our homes and to make a difference in us individually. God, I still believe that through us you can make a difference in our state. 
And you can make a difference in our county. God, I believe you can make a difference in our nation. I believe you can use this church, God, and these people. I believe you can use us to make a difference in this world for your honor and your glory. I pray you'd help us tonight uh, to start in the place of prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. As we begin to look here, we'll see a few things just right quickly. We'll see, first off, the priority of prayer. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 1, he makes uh, several mentions here. First off, he said, I exhort, therefore, that first of all. Then he said, uh, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. So first off, we see the obligation of prayer in this priority of the prayer. We see, he said, I exhort therefore. An exhortation here is more than just an invitation, but he's looking to invoke some to the place of prayer. When he uh, deals with them, he said, I exhort therefore. He's calling them. He's inviting them to gather around to hear what he has to say about this matter of prayer. He said, I exhort therefore. He's talking about their obligation in prayer. He invites them, but not just an invitation is given, but he's looking to invoke in them a desire to pray. Give them a desire uh, to go to the prayer place. And he's going to talk to them very specifically about some things of prayer. And then we see he gives an order of prayer. So there's not only an obligation of prayer here in verse number one, but there's an order of prayer. He said, first of all, I'm afraid in the day we live in, a lot of times we've got that backwards. Yeah. Prayer is the last thing that we do. When we don't know what we can do, we pray. When we've exhausted every other avenue, then we pray. But he said, first of all, prayer is to be in order. It's to be the first thing that we do. Listen, we ought not let our home get in a mess, and then when we don't know which way to go, then we begin to pray. We ought not let ourselves get without a job and then begin to pray about our job. We ought not let our relationships with, with uh, our brothers and sisters in Christ, our husbands and our wives, our children, our parents. Uh, I mean, you can name off a list a mile and a half long, but we ought not let our relationships get in turmoil before we begin to pray for those uh, that we're in a relationship with. Amen? Uh, listen, I'm telling you that prayer ought to be the first thing that we do in every aspect of life. I'd go as far as to say this. There's a lot of folks that want to mock and make fun of those that make prayer a priority. I believe you ought to make prayer such a priority that before you make your grocery list, you ought to pray about what you're going to put on it. Amen? Listen, I'm telling you every little detail is what I'm saying ought to be prayed about in the Christian life. I've heard them pray about where to park when they pull in the parking lot and folks mock them and make fun of them. Listen, I'm telling you, you can mark it down that the individual that prays about the little things like a parking spot will be the one that's the most effective for the cause of Christ. And the way that our steps will be ordered is because we've become a people that make prayer a priority and it's the first thing that we do is pray about every area of life. We see the obligation of prayer. We see the order of prayer. But then we see the object of prayer. What are we praying for? He said, he said this, I exhort thee. He said, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. We're praying for all men. Amen. We pray for ourselves. We pray for our spouse. We pray for our children. We pray for our church family. We pray for everybody and anybody we can think about to pray about. We ought to be praying about the lost coming to know Christ is their Savior. We ought to be praying about those that are in authority over us. We ought to be praying about our government. And he talks about that very specific here in just a moment. But you ought to be praying for your boss. You ought to be praying for your neighbors. I mean every man that we can think of. Every man, woman, boy and girl. We ought to be praying for them. Amen. You say, well, I don't have time to do all that. If we're too busy to pray, we're just plain too busy. Yeah, amen. Exactly right. amen. Yes, sir. There's the obligation of prayer. There's the order of prayer. There's the object of prayer being that it might be made for all men. There is a priority 
of prayer. Then we'll see here right quickly, there is a part that he lists here of prayer. Uh, he said, and I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Now, there are some things there in that list of prayers that we might, uh, I think, are the same thing. And then there are some things that we might not even uh, think that are prayers in general. Um, but you look at those different parts. Uh, and uh, you know this, at Matthew chapter number 6 and Luke chapter number 11, the Lord, uh, uh, he gave a pattern for prayer. And all of these things can fit into the pattern of prayer in some way or another. And you ought to get you a, a notebook of some sort and you ought to write you out a pattern for prayer. And y'all, uh, I keep a list. Uh, I listen, brother. I'm um, brother. Uh, uh, John Hamlin told me years ago. He asked me. I usually would pick one thing when I first started picking him up. Had he come to our home church there in Douglasville, and and uh, you know, uh, I'd, I'd ask if I could be the one that pick him up and take him back and forth uh, uh, to the airport and pick him up and take him uh, to the hotel room, and, and I'd try to pick his brains. What I wanted to do, I wanted to uh, learn what, what God had done in his life, and, and so I asked him one time. I said, I know you're real busy. I said, but if you could uh, just sometime while you're here, uh, just anything you can think about that I, I need in the area of prayer that'll be a help to me in the future, I want you to just jot it down for me and I, I want to take it and look over it if you don't mind. And, and you know, I figured, uh, you know, he'd write a little sentence or something and he wrote a whole outline, Brother Matthew, on prayer for me and, and gave it to me. And, and he talked about on there, he said, uh, he said, just like a Christian doesn't go to the grocery grocery store without a grocery list to make sure that they get everything that they have need of. He said, you need to make sure you go to the prayer place with a list. Amen. He talked about even the obligation in prayer and the order of prayer in that outline. He said that every time he goes into where he's going to be staying for the week, he goes in the motel room he's going to be in. He said, before he gets his luggage set down good, he's got the place that he's picked out that he's going to spend time with God. God in prayer in that room uh, throughout that week. I'm telling you, it ought to be uh, it ought to be a priority in our life. Uh, and listen, there's a relationship that's on the line, uh, and we ought to have a list uh, and to make sure that our relationship uh, is not missing anything between us and God. Amen. I mean, if God gave his disciples without their request in Matthew chapter number six. And per their request in, in Luke chapter number 11, a list of the way to pray, I think we ought to be interested enough to have a prayer pattern for our life. Amen. The pattern he gave there was um, a pattern of relationship. He said, pray our Father which art in heaven. It's a reverence prayer. He said, hallowed be thy name. It's a, a, a prayer of response. He said, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Then he begins to pray after he's done business with God in relationship and in reverence and in responding to the fact that his will is the most important thing. Then he prays prays for favor. Then he prays for forgiveness. And then he prays for the future. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. And he said, Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Listen, I'm telling you, we know that he's coming to sit upon the throne one day and that he's going to, re he's going to rule this world with a rod of iron. I mean, I'm telling you this, we ought to set him upon the throne of our life first thing every day before we ever get started good. We ought to enter into the prayer place. We ought to shut the door of the prayer place. I'd get alone by ourselves and spend time with God and make sure our relationship is what it should be yes, with Him. But look at the parts of prayer here. There's some different types of prayer, different parts of prayer that are mentioned in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 1. He talks about supplications there. Just by studying these different parts of the play, uh, prayer, I, I've just come to a I come to a, uh, a conclusion of what I believe each one of these represents, and I'll just give them to you right quickly. You can jot them down, and, and uh, you know if you disagree with them, then then you disagree with them. You just pray uh, the way you're supposed to pray, Amen. But they'll all be effect, uh, 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 all be a help to us if we'll use them in our life. Amen. We see supplications. I believe that supplication is a requesting prayer. You know, praying is asking, but not all prayer 
is asking. Not every time that we enter into prayer are we asking him for anything, but we ought to be asking him for some things. Amen. One preacher told me this years ago, he said, the request or your asking prayer ought to be so great. He said that if, and we understand this, don't get super spiritual on me. Uh, I know that prayer is a private thing, and, and I've learned the hard way that some things God does with me in prayer are not meant for public consumption. Amen. And uh, we ought to have some, uh, I believe he teaches us a principle in Matthew chapter number 6 uh, that, that, that uh, uh, if we enter into that secret place and pray to uh, our Father, which the Bible said there is in secret, our Father, which is in secret, then he'll reward us openly. Matter of fact, I believe there's a a pretty distinct principle there um, that would show us that our Father is in secret a lot of times because of our failure to pray in secret. Because we're not entering into a secret place and and talking to our Father. He's not rewarding us openly. And so that's why he's a secret to this world is because we're not entering into the secret place. And therefore he's remaining secret because that's how he works in the day we live in is through the lives of believers in and and through uh, everything around us. And listen, I'm telling you, I believe that the reason the world doesn't see our Father oftentimes Times, uh, it's because we're not entering in uh, and spending any time with our Father. Right. There ought to be some things we ask Him. That preacher said years ago, he said, he said, your prayer request and your prayer journal ought to be such that if a man was to open it and look at it, if there weren't some things in there that you're asking God for that would be so large it would cause people to laugh at you, he said, you're probably not asking God for enough. I mean, folks would think we're crazy if they really knew the great things we were asking God for. But I guarantee you, just in a crowd this size tonight, we could go around the room and there'd be more than one of us that could testify to things that there's no way we could have got done on our own that we asked God to do and he met the need. Amen. Some things you pray for like that for years and some things you pray for and it happens in a matter of moments. But God is a God that hears and answers prayer. There ought to be supplications, requesting prayers. And then he talks about just simply prayers there. I believe that those prayers that he mentions there, I believe they're reminder prayers. I believe uh, uh, some some years ago, I'll just uh, give you an example here of what I'm talking about. Uh, Some years ago, I went to a youth meeting and and Brother Mark Stroud called on a gentleman. I I didn't know who the gentleman was then. I don't know who he is now. Uh, But the gentleman got up and, and uh, he called on him to pray, and the gentleman stood up in a in a large meeting, and and I'm going to have to uh, you know take my halo off here and admit that I was being very critical. The man stood up, and as he began to pray, he began to uh, quote scripture to the Lord, and he quoted scripture, brother Matthew, and he quoted scripture, and he quoted scripture, and me sitting there in my critical spirit, I thought to myself, brother Beery, I said, does that man think that God doesn't know what he wrote in his Bible? And but you know, the more I've studied prayer, and the more I've studied uh, uh, men of prayer uh, and reading their biographies and the things. They've wrote on prayer. I'm the more I'm, I've been uh, taught, and the more I've been reminded uh, that these reminder prayers, uh, and prayers where we use our Bible in our prayer place, uh, and prayers where God, uh, I mean, has given us. Uh, listen, He gave us the whole Bible all together. I mean, I'm telling you, sometimes you take this Bible into the place of prayer, uh, and you get along with you and God in this Bible, and God will make some verses real, uh, uh, real special to you. I, I I mean, he'll take some things and implant it deep in your heart, and he'll give you a he'll give you a word from his word that you'll need to give back to him sometimes, just so that you and I can be reminded of what God done in his heart. You know, brother Matthew, I got a Bible sitting back there in my office that some years ago I wrecked a truck, and old brother Eddie Gordon told me. He said, "How you doing, son?" I said, "I said, brother Eddie, I'm about to go stir crazy. I can't stand." sitting around all the time and he pointed that old long finger at me and he said young man you better learn how to build up a little corn for the famine he said you better get you a secret place with God and I knew that my dad had testified to how brother Eddie he 
said you'd get up in the prophet's chamber and Brother Ed in 5 o'clock in the morning and already be in the sanctuary. And he said you'd hear him in there praying and talking to God. And I said, Brother Ed, I know it's got the touch of God on his life. I've sat and listened to him preach. I've witnessed a touch of God on his life. And Brother Matthew, I said, if that man of God told me I need to get a secret place and the Word of God tells me I need to get a secret place or that I'm going to spend a little extra time while I've got extra time to spend in the secret place. And I got a Bible back there in my office that I've went back to so many times and looked through notes. Some things that God put in my heart during that time that have not come to pass, but many things that have come to pass. But Brother Beery, I have went back through those notes so many times I about wore my pen notes off the pages of that Bible. Just going back and seeing the things that God did in my heart during those, on those few months while I couldn't work. I'm telling you there's some prayers of reminders. There's verses God put in my heart in that day that I still use in my prayer place uh, to this day. Amen. I think about Brother R.G. Smith and, and Brother R.G. Smith is a man that has seen God uh, do many, many things. And I think about how that one year he raised the money to build uh, in one year alone he raised the money to, uh, to build ten churches in Africa. Ten church buildings buildings in Africa and how that God supplied the money uh, for those well over a hundred thousand dollars God supplied uh, and to build those ten churches uh, and you hear him talk about it but uh, one of the things uh, um, that he taught me was to study men of prayer and how they prayed uh, and he talked about how he went to the different places uh, in, he went to where uh, E.M. Bounds uh, the great man of prayer uh, uh, the con con confederate chaplain from years ago uh, lived just over in Washington Georgia you know you can still go in and see where he prayed at in the house over there in a, in a little museum, Brother Ron. And a man, just a man of prayer and wrote uh, many books on prayer. But God used him and he talked about how that he studied those men of prayer and, and went to where they prayed and how God put in his heart about those prayer promises. And now he's got over a hundred uh, prayer promises written down uh, that he goes through every day as he begins his prayer time. You may not start out with a hundred, but why don't you get your ten? You may not start out with a hundred but it would hurt you uh, to get five or just two or three to start out. Uh, I mean some things that God uh, has put in our heart uh, but we're going to have to get our Bible and get along with God. Amen. We see supplications. We see prayers. We see intercessions. And you got supplications. I believe that's requesting prayer. And the prayers mentioned here I believe they're reminding prayers. And then intercessions I believe that we could call those resistance prayer. What, what, what an intercessory prayer is, is when we're interceding on behalf of another. That's why I call it resistance prayers. Matter of fact, I believe it's when we intercede for another that's, uh, uh, you know, oftentimes others try to hit the self-destruct button right. on their own life. Yeah. I mean, they're so far from God, they don't even see the shape they're in in the sight of God. Yeah. And oftentimes even in the sight of this world. They need somebody to intercede for them. Yeah. Matter of fact, I'd go as far as to say this. When I started talking about that, I would dare say that just about everybody in this room, somebody came to your mind. Yes, sir. I mean, a specific name probably came into your mind yes. when I mentioned that. You want me to tell you who that person ought to be? Mm -hmm. Ought to be a person that we're interceding for. Yes, You're right. yes. Amen. We ought to go to God for them, though they don't even know they need to go to God for theirself. Yes. And oftentimes, I mean, they're doing everything they can to destroy their life. And, uh, you know, if you look at your Bible, uh, the Bible talks about to uh, uh, cause, cause Satan the accuser of the brethren. And you know, uh, I believe it was old Leonard Ravenhill that made the statement. He said, when we're most like Satan is when we're accusing the brethren. Yeah. And I tell you that to tell you this, that uh, when we're the most like Christ is when we're interceding in prayer for others. Hebrews chapter 7, verse number 24, the Bible said, He ever liveth to make intercession. He ever liveth to make intercession. But oftentimes we spend so much time being like Satan and accusing the brethren, we don't have time to be like Christ and intercede for the brethren. 
or intercede for the lost. You know, there's folks that hadn't even come to the place. I got one man in my mind right now. I won't call his name, but I watch him and I see him. And he's been a dear friend through the years and, and was a coach to me in high school. And, and I think about him often, just a burden rolls over my heart for where he's going to spend eternity if he doesn't get saved. And he makes statements like, if God be real. And you know, I know that one day God's going to make himself so real to that coach of mine uh, that he's going to trust Christ to save him. And I'm looking forward to that day. Amen. Amen. But I do my best to try to intercede on his behalf. Uh, he doesn't know God. I uh, doesn't even know if God's real. So how could he pray for himself uh, when he doesn't even know if God's real? He told me one time that he was an extremely skeptical deist. Uh, he believes, uh, uh, he's very skeptical about it, but he believes maybe God exists somewhere out in the universe, uh, but he doesn't have any dealings with man. And I know, and I, I try to ask God as often as I think about it, and as often as, you know, as I come past my prayer list, uh, I I try to ask God to make himself so real to him uh, uh, that there's no way that he could deny just how real God Amen. is. Amen. Amen. And I'm looking forward to the day when God answers that prayer. So we see supplications. We see prayers. We see intercessions. And then we see the prayer of giving thanks. Amen. You know, Thanksgiving is more just a time where we have a good meal. Right. Yes. Thanksgiving is more than just a, a, a month that we set out to name one thing every day that we're thankful for. Thanksgiving is something that ought to be the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Amen. Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 3, the Bible said, I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those the women which labored with me in the gospel, which Clement also with other my, my fellow laborers whose names are, are in the book of life. Uh, he said, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Uh, he said, Let your moderation be known unto all men. Uh, the Lord is at hand. Now notice what he says here. He said, Be careful for nothing. You know what that literally means? It means to not be anxious. How many of you hear all the time about anxiety in the day we live in? You know why we're such an anxious people? It's because we're such a prayerless people. Why anxiety overwhelms. You know, there's people that literally, I know grown people that have, ne I mean, never drove a car in their life, never worked a job. Because anxiety has so overwhelmed them. Imagine what prayer could make a difference in their life. Amen. He said, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Notice what he said in verse number 8. He said, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. You know what we'll be amazed on our prayer list ought to be a list Amen. of things that we're thankful for. I think about the preacher some years ago. I've heard the testimony that he made up his mind one Sunday evening after church that he was going to, or one Saturday evening before church, that he was going to get up on Sunday and he was going to resign his church. And he sat down and he wrote out the letter of resignation. And he thought to himself as he folded that letter of resignation and tucked it in his Bible to be read the next day and and resignation had been having a difficult time at the church. And, and he thought to himself, he said, you know what? Just before I go home and go to bed, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take out another piece of paper and write down the things I'm thankful that the Lord's done in my life. Amen. And he got that list out and he began to write on it and write on it and write on it until eventually he just took that letter of resignation out of his Bible Amen. and tore it up and put it in the trash. Listen, I'm telling you oftentimes the weights of life and the weights of ministering to others can get us down. But it'll get the best of us quicker than we think if we don't have a spirit of, of gratitude toward the Lord. That's why the prayer of thanksgiving ought to be in our mind and in our heart 
every day. Amen. And so we see the, the parts of prayer. We see the priority of prayer. Let me give you this right here really quickly. Let's look at the proper use of prayer. First Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 2. He said, For kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. The first thing he mentions there is that we ought to pray for our leaders. I mean, it ought to be on your mind. Everywhere you go, you see signs and you hear commercials and you hear people talking and, and there's so much division. I'm going to tell you, we need to be praying for our leaders. Just as much as we're facing division and we get so tired of hearing about the election and the different campaign ads and so forth over and over and over again, and I've had people tell me, I'll be glad when the election's over just so I don't have to hear these campaign ads anymore, just so they'll stop texting me all the time. I'm going to tell you what. We ought to be a people of prayer for our leaders. People of prayer. I ought to be praying for our leaders. We ought to be praying for the liaisons. You, you say, what is that? He said, for all, all that are in authority. I was listening to, a, uh, to an interview with Donald Trump earlier today, and, or, or yesterday rather, and uh, he was talking about as soon as, uh, as soon as he got in the White House the first time, he really didn't know what to expect. And he said he was, he was uh, amazed at how he was flooded as soon as he got there with the need. There, you realize that there are over 10,000 people, not that he directly appoints, but people that need to be appointed into positions of leadership immediately. When a president, 10,000. That's amazing. Is that crazy? You know what a liaison is? A liaison is one that communicates. You know, there's not a one of us that just go into the president's office and communicate. But there's different levels of government all the way down and, and local government and, and folks that we, we communicate with. And, and uh, I mean, you, you think about this. Every one of those people need to be prayed for. Need to be prayed for. We ought to be praying for our leaders. We ought to be praying for liaisons. We ought to be praying for life. You realize what he says here? He said, For kings, for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. You know, we think about the shape our country's in and the shape this world is in. And if we be honest with ourselves, according to this text, it's a result of a lack of prayer. Yeah, you're right. No, look what he said. He said, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. That quiet and peaceable life represents a life without disturbance. The quiet there that he talks about, uh, uh, the first mention of, of that phrase there, a quiet, a, 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 a quiet, lead a quiet uh, a place there. The first mention of that's in Isaiah 33 and, and verse number 20. The Bible said, look upon, uh, look upon Zion, the city of, of the Solomonites. Uh, uh, thine eyes shall see Jerusalem, a quiet habitation, a tabernacle that shall not be taken down, not one that, sh uh, that stakes thereof shall ever be removed, neither shall any of the cords thereof be broken. Do you realize that that's what God did in the nation of Israel's life? Uh, he brought them out of Egypt uh, and he brought, uh, uh, he, he brought, uh, 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 Abraham out of the earth, the Chaldeans, and he meant for them to get to, uh, to the promised land, and he meant for Jerusalem to be a place where there would be a permanent dwelling place where he could meet with his people at, and that's what he's talking about. Jerusalem would represent a place where there would be a tabernacle that wasn't like a tabernacle in the wilderness anymore, and that word quiet there uh, literally means a, a place that uh, a place that is uh, uh, that that is away from others, a place where there's uh, no disturbance. Uh, and listen, I'm telling you this, you ever feel like, uh, man, I just wish I could live for God uh, and there wouldn't be so much opposition all the time? Uh, do you know that God desires for us to be able uh, to live this life like that? But we don't pray a lot of times. Yes, sir. 
to be able to see that kind of life. He talked about that it'd be a place where it wouldn't be, and that tabernacle wouldn't be a temporary thing anymore, but it'd be a place where one stake shall never be removed. Listen, God desires to move in our life. He come from the tabernacle in the wilderness to the temple, and now he tabernacles, he tabernacles in you and I. And listen, he doesn't mean for us to, uh, to be so driven about. To, uh, listen, you, you think about it. I mean the, 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 sm the small things, things that we take for granted oftentimes, uh, the price of gasoline, the price of groceries. Uh, uh, listen, uh, uh, the, 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 how much the, the, uh, the uh, tax, or a property tax is. I mean, we would be amazed at all the things that keep us away from living for God. Right. A quiet, he said, a peaceable life. The root word of that word peaceable there carries two thoughts. There's two root words. It means to be steadfast and settled. That's how God means for us to live. He said for us to live, he wants us to live a life without the disturbances of this world. And he knows that one day we're going to live that way. Right. But he means for us to be striving in the place of prayer to live that kind of life now. How do we do that? By praying for leaders, by praying for their liaisons, by praying for all men. Listen, he means for us to, the proper use of prayer is to pray for leaders, to pray for li liaisons, to pray uh, for a Christian life without disturbances, and to pray for a Christian life without uh, the influence of darkness. Uh, the root word, that word darkness there is, is the word uh, that's the same as devout. And uh, you know the Bible talks about uh, uh, that we're to have piety. That word piety there is, uh, is reverence. It all ties in together with that um, devout. You know you hear people a lot of times say are they devout Jews? Are they, are they devout? Devout Catholics, and, and what they want to know is, uh, is are they people that, that reverence what they believe enough that, that it becomes a permanent uh, practice with them? Um, do you know that oftentimes uh, uh, those in false religions uh, are a whole lot more devoted to what they believe than yeah. you and I are that have a bit of uh, Bible truth? Amen. Uh, I'm telling you, uh, um, the more I get to know people and the more I talk to people and um, the more I run into people that are absolutely confused. Uh, we talked to a gentleman just the other day uh, um, that told us 90 years old on his 90th birthday he told us that he hoped uh, that he'd see his wife in heaven again someday uh, and I mean still uh, and we took the Bible or uh, we took some verses from the Bible and tried to talk to him there uh, about it a little bit uh, and he knew said he knew a time when he asked the Lord to save him uh, but the man I mean can you imagine being 90 years old and still living in fear about where you're going to spend eternity you know why people are that way? Because we're not devoted to truth. Yeah. You know what brings about devotion? Piety or reverence. Yeah. Causes us to be committed, yes, devoted to truth. If we reverence the God of this book, we'll reverence this book. Right. If we reverence this book, there will be results in this life. There will be the fruit of this book will manifest itself through our life. We'll be devoted to what this Bible tells us to do, to reaching others and teaching them what this Bible says. And so he wants us to, uh, to, to be peaceable, to, be, uh, to, to live a life without disturbance. He wants us to, to live a life uh, absent from darkness. He wants us to live a life without having to become debased all the time. He said, uh, he, he talks about uh, um, that we might live a quiet and peaceable life. Look what he says there. In all godliness. That's the absent from darkness. And then he said, and honesty. In all godliness and honesty. Listen, honesty is what he desires to be the purpose of our life. That we not become debased all the time. Listen, we understand that we're sinners. We're all sinners. And that we're always going to struggle with sin in this life. But I'm telling you, the closer that we draw with him, uh, the closer we draw to him, the easier time we'll have staying away from sin. And, you know, don't you ever get tired of feeling like things are going to 
seep their way out through your life and, and uh, you know, people are going to realize. I mean, anybody else in here just feel like you're wicked all the time and it's a constant fight to just keep it fought back? God doesn't mean for us to, to have to feel that. But, you know, if we get to the place where we live honest lives, honest lives right. produce an honest living. You may tell you one thing I noticed about Bible college. We went to Bible college in Powell, Tennessee. I noticed that everybody in that area wanted students from that Bible college to work for them. You know why? Because there was generations of people living honest lives that had taught generations of people how to make an honest living. Not to get a saddle on a clock. Not to just give as much effort as they can get away with giving or as little effort as they can get away with giving, but I mean to make an honest living. I mean, if we're Christians, we're the children of God, and we go into work for somebody, we ought to give it all we've got. You're right. Amen. Not just what we can get by with. We ought to make an honest living. We ought to have honest language. Yes. Amen. We ought not have to be ashamed of the things we say. Amen. We ought not have to be ashamed of the words we use or the things we say about people. We ought to have honest language. There ought to be honest leadership. We look around and we, we get so disgusted. And honestly, I see more people in the day we live in that are more dis I mean, that are just absolutely seem like they're disgusted with leadership on both sides, whatever party they represent. Well, what are we going to do? Sit around for the rest of our lives complaining about it? Right. Or are we going to do our best to train some folks to be honest leaders? Yes. To pray for folks to become followers of God that they might be honest leaders. And then we see that honest life produces some honest lessons. You want me to tell you when we get real honest with ourselves and before God in the place of prayer... It'll help us to learn the lessons that we need to learn as individuals. If we get to the place where we can never be led, we've honestly got a problem is what we got. Every one of us need to be led.